Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 16th Annual Virtual Worlds Best Practices in Education. It's a glorious day to start this conference, and I'm pleased to introduce our first keynote speaker. Tom Bukowski is here. Tom Belsdorf is a professor of anthropology at the University of California, Irvine a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and former editor-in-chief of American Anthropologist. The flagship journal of the American Anthropological Association, their research has focused on topics including digital culture, disability, game studies, globalization, nationalization, nationalism, queer studies, and the history of technology. They are the author of The Gay Archipelago, Sexuality and the Nation in, and Nation in Indonesia, published by Princeton University Press, A Coincidence of Desires, and Coming of Age in Second Life, an Anthropologist Explores the Virtual Human. They are co-author of the forthcoming, this keeps moving, sorry. They are co-author of the forthcoming Intelligent Visions, the in Intellivision System, Video Games and Society, and Ethnography and Virtual Worlds, a Handbook of Method by Princeton University Press, and co-editor of Data and Now Bigger and Better. Prickly Paradigm Press, and Speaking in Queer Tongues, Globalization and Gay Language, Indiana University Press. He's been busy. Dr. Belsdorf has a forthcoming book on the Intellivision video game system, co-authored with Braxton Soderman, also at the University of California, Irvine. <clears throat> Dr. Belsdorf's articles have appeared in venues including the American Anthropologist, American Ethnologist, an Annual Review of Anthropology, Cultural Anthropology, Current Anthropology, Disability Studies Quarterly, Games and Culture, International Journal of Communication, Journal of Asian Studies, Journal of Linguistic Anthropology, Ethnos, GLOW, a Journal of Gay and Lesbian Studies, Media, Culture, and Society, and Visible Anthropology Review. Now, please welcome Dr. Bellstarp with a nice, warm round of applause. Take it away, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind uh, introduction, um, Ice Sky. Um, I Sky and I go way back, and it's so nice to, well, many of you and I go way back, so it's great to see everyone. Hey, Gentle. Yes, well, actually, Gentle, since we've authored together, you know that. We're co-authors. <laughs> so um, thanks, everyone, um, so much. And so um, I'm so honored to be here. I think this is one of the most amazing organizations in the whole metaverse. I am always talking about Virtual Worlds Best Practices in Education Group as absolute and continuing pioneers. So thank you, thank you. So happy to be here. And um, thank you, Electra and others for um, doing some transcribing. I will uh, try to talk slow and I'm a good, I can type when I talk a bit, so I will try to type a bit too, but I really appreciate that. Um, um, just to keep things moving along. So what I'm going to do today is tell you about me and sort of my past, and then talk about where we're going um, around the metaverse and the incredible role that this organization can play and how we can sort of clear some of the confusion that's out there. Um, we're at a very exciting new time for new frontiers, new possibilities with the metaverse if we get it right. <laughs> so as um, um, I, I mentioned in that very kind introduction, when I started um, my life as an anthropologist, I did research in Indonesia studying gay and lesbian Indonesians, and this goes back to the 1990s, and I wrote two books on that <clears throat> research, and I won't go into the detail of it there, just to say my method as an anthropologist that I used was ethnographic. And what that means is instead of a laboratory kind of situation or a survey, 
you are participating with people in their every life, everyday life. They get to know you and you get to see what people actually do because the, the danger of interviews by themselves is that what people say they do and what they actually do are not always the same thing, right? And here is a picture of me, you can see me at the back, with a group of gay and trans Indonesians um, designing an HIV prevention program together. That's part of what I did when I was there. And after doing that research for about more than 10 years, actually, I had always been interested in, in technology and virtual worlds. And so if you look at that picture, you'll see something similar now when I move to Second Life. Could I use that similar approach to studying culture in virtual worlds, right? So that was uh, the sort of idea that I had for doing my Second Life research was, could I do this? Would it work, right? And, you know, to do this kind of research here. And the answer is yes. And it wasn't even that hard because there's culture here, there's people, um, and it's real, right? So here you can do this kind of, of, of research as well. And that's what led to my book, Coming of Age and Second Life. Um, some other books that I've written, like this handbook of methods that I wrote with some friends, um, and even the new research that I'm just starting to begin now. And so uh, for me, like for some of us, our engagement with Second Life goes way back. Here's my first house in Second Life from 2004. I found a picture of it, a screenshot. It's uh, not there anymore, obviously, but it's on the Kane Sim. There's a volcano sort of nearby, and uh, there's a little peninsula, and I, can, I sometimes like to go back there to see where my house used to be. Um, but for probably 15 years now almost, I've had land in Dowden on the mainland. It's a very nice little valley. Um, I don't build with sculpties or uh, I can't do any of that fancy blender stuff. So thank you for the kind someone just gave me a shout out. I love building in Second Life, but I'm and I'm old school. I do it all old school, which I think is really fun. Um, so yes, go visit my house. It's open. Anyone can go go see it. I'm still doing some finishing touches, but this will be my headquarters for research for the next several years. Um, since this conference is about education, um, and yes, thank you, Marley, go old school. Um, during COVID, I tried to move my teaching, not just into Zoom, but into Second Life. So I actually had an island here, um, Anteater Island, that's the mascot of my university. There you can see the entry area. This is a picture that Inara actually took, um, so it's very nice. And if you look, to the right on that picture, you see a map uh, there over on the right. Here's a close-up of that map. So what I did was, on this island, I made it for a class that I teach, that I'm teaching right now, they're just doing their finals, called Digital Cultures, where the students do team research projects about culture online. And so here what I did was I made a lecture area, that's where that number one triangle is, and I made areas for the students to do their research projects, those are in yellow, but I also made an office for myself and places to hang out um, to try and think about what virtual worlds could do differently during the pandemic. So this was the lecture area, it's sort of like what we are sitting in right now with a screen where I could show slides and the groups could meet. But then in the middle of the island, we had a camping area where we could watch TV together. Um, there were video games, arcade games to play. And for a lot of the students, this was getting back something they had lost during COVID. Um, it was a place to hang out. And I got this idea from virtual worlds, best practices in education. If you have not looked around these islands, oh my God, do it. Because what is so brilliant about this group is 
that you don't just make this lecture hall. There are art galleries, there's a cafe, there are so many things to explore in these sims. That is the future of the metaverse in general, but also with education. <clears throat> so I got this idea from Virtual World's Best Practices in Education. They had a place to hang out, but then as I said, each group had a place where they could create a presentation area about their research. So this is a group, you can't see the details, but this is a group that did research on Animal Crossing right at the beginning of the pandemic. This is a group presenting on their research about dating online. And you can see to the left, it's a little hard to see, but they actually made like a miniature version of a cell phone where you could swipe right or swipe left. It's not miniature actually, it's like 15 feet tall there as you can see for an avatar. But it was a fun way for people to um, play around with the results of the research and present research in a new way that a virtual world makes possible. So those are just some examples of what I did during the pandemic, as so many of us did, showing some potential things that can uh, virtual worlds can do. So now I want to talk about where we are going, because as um, iSky mentioned in their very kind introduction, I'm just finishing a book about Intellivision, this video game system from the late 1970s and early 1980s. And just in the process of switching to a big new research project on the metaverse, and I don't even know exactly where it's going to go, except that part of it is definitely going to be in uh, Second Life for sure. Oh yeah, we write about IntelliVoice. We write about IntelliVoice. We have a whole chapter on IntelliVoice. It's a, actually a very interesting um, um, extension. But um, I will not talk about that today. What I will talk about today, unless there's time in the Q&A, is sort of basic things to think about as we are moving forward into what um, we might call an anthropology of the metaverse, or the, this, a study of what this is going to do for human life and for education. And this includes AI, things like chat GPT, I will talk about that in a second. But the first thing that we need to do very much is to get beyond all the confusion, the hype, the anti-hype saying that it's, you know, all just fake and isn't going to be useful, or the hype that it's going to change everything. It's hard to even start a conversation about the metaverse right now because there is so much confusion. Just to give you a, a way to see that, think about all of the images that come with articles about the metaverse that you have probably read on your phone or computer. Over and over again, you see these kinds of hilarious images of people with a headset and there's sort of stars around them or something. There are so many. I could have put 20 of these up. I'm sure you've seen them. All of these people with a headset and their hands waving around um, over and over again. And this tells us something. So think about this image. What if I told you I want to show you Animal Crossing? Wow, isn't that cool? Look at my island in Animal Crossing. Isn't that great? Oh, here, let me show you this conference. We're having a great time here at the Virtual World's Best Practices in Education. We, we don't show a picture of the interface normally when we are talking about something online. And this sort of shows that there's real confusion about what is actually there. They don't even know, so they just put a picture of a person wearing a headset. <laughs> so one thing this shows is a real confusion around interface compared to place. We have these two phrases 
that look very similar, virtual reality and virtual world, but they are actually very different. And that this causes a lot of confusion because we are in a time right now where these are going to start coming together more, where, for instance, you might use a headset to go into Second Life or something like that. But they are never going to be overlapping 100%. That's not what's going to be happening. That's part of the hype and part of the confusion. And this obviously has important uh, ramifications for education as well. And one real problem that I have with VR, that idea, it is really unfortunate that 20, 30 years ago, the word reality got linked to these headsets, to a three-dimensional kind of interface. That is wrong, and it is ableist. It makes it seem like people with vision impairment, people who are blind, will somehow can't go into the metaverse. Right? That makes no sense. There's a real problem with the phrase virtual reality because it includes inside of it an assumption that interface is what makes things real. And that's just not true. So here at this conference, for the very first time <laughs> publicly, let history show, <laughs> I propose that we get rid of the phrase VR, and rename it something like SI, sensory immersion. Because it can be really wonderful, those headsets. We can see all kinds of potential uses for them, but not because they make things real, right? They can have all kinds of potential uses, but it's not that the senses make things real. That is incorrect and it is confusing, and it is causing a lot of confusion out there about the metaverse in general, but also about what actually counts as real. Because what makes something real? What makes our interactions together here today real is that we are in a shared place. Virtual worlds are virtual reality. Virtual worlds are virtual reality. This grid is something that I, um, is in an article of mine from several years ago, trying to get away from the idea that on one side you have real life and on the other side you have online. In the year 2023, by now we know this is not true. If you study German online, you can go to Berlin and talk to people. <laughs> if you make a friend in Second Life, that friend is a real friend, right? Um, it's, that is, that's not how it works. So if you look at this grid, some things online are unreal. That is D, the lower right. If I'm a dragon and I eat you in Second Life, I didn't really eat you, right? But if we have an education that, that's real, that's B there, that's that square B. The whole idea of education in virtual worlds makes no sense if you assume it's all unreal. But to me, what's important about this grid I made is also the other side, because a danger of the idea of in real life is that it assumes everything physical is real. I live in... Los Angeles, where there's Hollywood, there's Disneyland. We had Halloween a few months ago. <laughs> there are many things that are physical that are not real. So the degree to which something is real or not is an interesting question. But it is a completely separate question from if it is online or offline. Those are two separate things. 
the ways in which something is online or offline, and the way in which something is real or not real. Both are interesting, but they are distinct. And this helps us begin to get past some of the hype. The confusion about sensory immersion, what, what people call VR, but I, I really want to call something like sensory immersion, because it is not what makes something real, is that you put a headset on. This is just one example of something that's happening a lot right now, of people telling you that something is optional, that something that is part of the metaverse, trying to tell you that it is required, that it must be there. When people do this, they are usually trying to sell you something. <laughs> when people say that something must be part of the metaverse, they are usually trying to tell you something. And getting past this hype is really important because I know from the history book I'm writing right now, it's amazing how in the 70s and 80s, even in the early 1990s, um, a lot of the internet was around universities and government and military. Companies still didn't know how to make money off of it. It was relatively small, right? Now, we live in a world where 95% of the metaverse is corporate owned. There are wonderful things like open sim out there and we need more of them. But the metaverse is deeply shaped by corporate thinking and we always want to be prepared to counter that pipe because it distracts us. It gets in the way of asking good questions and doing good research, and it feeds the opposite, saying that the metaverse is over, it's never going to work, shut it all down or whatever. So just to give you a couple examples, and I know this is a lot of text, these are just examples from people who are smart. I'm sure, oh, I actually cut this down to two examples instead of four. You've all seen examples of this, where people try to define the metaverse, and they say things like, it is a massively scaled and interoperable network of real-time rendered 3D virtual worlds with all this other stuff, right? Or the one down below, it'll be made of 3D virtual worlds that have to be connected, that have VR, that have um, NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Many of you have seen these kinds of things. So, oh, I know what my four examples are. I'm going to show you four examples of things that people say are necessary that are not necessary to the metaverse that are not, and that it matters. So the first one is the one I just mentioned, virtual reality. The metaverse will not require those headsets that you see everywhere in those pictures. The metaverse is about social immersion, not sensory immersion, social immersion in shared place, like what we have right now. And this is a 3D virtual world, even though we're all probably using screens, and some of us might be using Radagast and viewing this as text. And there are still many um, text-based virtual worlds, right? Going back to things like Lambda Moo. Those are 3D, even though they're made up of text, because you can move in them in three dimensions. So what will happen is there will be some use of sensory immersion in the metaverse, right? The 3D VR kind of stuff but not everyone will use it. And even those of us who do use it will almost certainly not be using it all the time. And you see many examples of that um, where a virtual world will have a 2D you know, uh, set up for building, let's say, and then you go, you use you know, SI, VR glasses to see it, you know, that kind of thing. So that is one example VR, or what I want to call SI, of something that people are trying to sell us on the idea that 
the metaverse must have VR, which is not true. It can have it, but it's not required. Here's a second example. As you saw from those paragraphs I showed, often people say the metaverse will be interconnected, all of these different virtual worlds being connected, that you will have an avatar that you can move between all these different virtual worlds. Come on, people, like, where does this idea even come from? There is no reason that the metaverse has to be inoperable. If it, sorry, interoperable. If I am going to go shoot people in Fortnite, why do I need that to be my same identity as on Facebook or LinkedIn? The idea that people are pushing when they say it has to be interoperable is because they want to track you. They want to sell you things. Mark Zuckerberg wants it to be interoperable. But he is tricking us when he or other people say that the metaverse must be interoperable. What we will see moving forward will be many forms of connection, but also important forms of separation. There might be a case where I want my Second Life avatar and maybe something in LinkedIn to be connected. I'm not saying it's always bad. It might be great. What we need to push back on is the idea that it is necessary. When people say it's necessary, they are trying to sell us something. I think what we will find in the next five to 10 years emerging is not interoperability in most cases, but shared cultural practices. Think about how the idea of something as simple as copy and paste you use in so many different programs, right? Or pinching and zooming on a flat screen. Or I friend someone in Second Life and you can also do a similar thing on LinkedIn or, or Facebook or in mini games. Or even going away from keyboard, AFK, you can do that in so many places, so many different virtual worlds. But that's not because they're interoperable. It's about a kind of shared language, if you see what I'm saying. A third example of, of people trying to sell us about something is that the metaverse will be massive. It will be a billion people or whatever. This is a more influence of technology hype, where if it's not the next iPhone, it's uninteresting. If it's not growing, then let's move on to the next thing. You would not believe how many people ask me, is Second Life still around? They never ask me, is Indonesia still around? And part of it is because if it's not the new shiny thing that's coming out next month, it's somehow unimportant, right? And what counts as massive anyway? 100,000 is massive. I mean, in some ways, 10,000 is pretty massive. If you put 10,000 people in a room, um, that can be massive, right? Second Life has, you know, 400,000 whatever active users. There are many human cultures much smaller than that that have five, 10,000 people in them and they're very important. Anthropologists don't only study China and India. <laughs> We live in small communities often all over the world. And so this idea that the metaverse will only be interesting if everyone is doing it is another influence of the hype. It will not always be massive. And we need to ask how we can study and understand these different sized communities and their connections. Because we even see this with, um, you know, online with things like Twitch, if, there, if you uh, know of things like microblogging, there are people who blog about a very particular topic to 10 or 20 or 50 people. And that's a real community, and that's important and interesting, right? And there's lots and lots of those. But often they get ignored because 
you can't make a huge amount of money on them is what people think, right? Once again, the effect of the corporate dominance of the metaverse. My last example is crypto, uh, which is very relevant today with the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and everything else. Oh my gosh, all of these people saying that the metaverse has to involve blockchain has to involve these non-fungible tokens. <laughs> we had non-fungible tokens 20 years ago in Second Life, by the way, right? Just make something and set it to no copy, no transfer, right? We know how to do that. The idea that the metaverse has to use crypto, has to use Bitcoin or something, is just people trying to find a justification for crypto. Right, trying to find that killer app. There is no reason why that must be the case. There are many, many virtual worlds that do just great with physical world currencies like the dollar or currencies that are exchangeable for physical currencies like the Linden dollar. In fact, Philip Rosedale a couple months ago made a very good point about one reason Bitcoin, that kind of thing is very... Uh, bad actually for uh, content creators and, and, and small business people in a place like Second Life is that it goes up and down so much. If I'm selling shirts in Second Life and there are 200 Linden, that needs to be stable. Right? I can't run my business, right? <clears throat> so there are many virtual worlds that don't use crypto. And by the way, there can be virtual worlds that don't have capitalism, don't have money. There's no reason they must be that way. It's just because of the corporate dominance of the internet right now and of the metaverse that that seems to be the case. So once again, as with my earlier examples, I'm not saying that a, a virtual world cannot use crypto, cannot use uh blockchain technologies or Ethereum or Bitcoin, there might be some great cases where that happens. What I am pushing back on is the idea that it is necessary. This is where you see the hype. So the metaverse is still very hard to define, but based on the things I just said, as a kind of rough definition, I would say that what the metaverse will be <clears throat> is a network of virtual worlds that are sometimes interconnected, sometimes use SI, use VR, sometimes use mobile devices, sometimes use crypto, sometimes use social media or connected to Discord or something like that, that usually use avatars usually have some kind of gaming element to it, but not always. And they don't even always have to have avatars um, that are usually given the reality in which we live right now, usually owned by for-profit companies, but not always. And the only things that I would say are always going to be there is, first of all, virtual presence that we are shared in a shared place like we are right now in this beautiful venue. And that there will always be connections to physical world, cultures, and places. Because all of us right now are sitting somewhere in the physical world. And that shapes us. Whether we're alone or together with others in the physical world, that obviously has some kind of influence on the online interaction. So that's my best attempt at a first definition. And the reason why I'm going to all this trouble to talk about hype and misunderstanding and definitions early on, which are important, is because I do think there are some dangers, two dangers in particular for us to keep in mind as we move forward. One of them right now is using COVID and the pandemic as our benchmark for the metaverse. There was a lot of incredible creativity during COVID. People did amazing stuff online. I had so much fun with my island. 
But there was also a lot of just trying to make it work for class or for my job or for a restaurant trying to do delivery of food or something. Um, there was a lot of sloppy stuff that happened, a lot of stuff that didn't work so well. And we don't want people to think that means the metaverse is somehow flawed, right, or can never work. Um, for educators, and many of you I know are educators, the lack of institutional support during COVID was a real issue. So Second Life was very hard for me to get my students to use, but part of that was that they had to learn it for just one class, and there was no support at my university. For Zoom or Canvas, if you know what that is, there were workshops, there were peer educators, there was, you know, walkthroughs, YouTube videos, so much support. And so I don't blame Second Life. If there had been that kind of support, and if my students were learning Second Life for several different classes, it, they could have learned it quite easily, right? It's not that hard. <laughs> and they did learn it. I mean, a lot of them got good at it. But it was harder because it was during the pandemic. We do want to build on best practices and experiment. There's some amazing stuff that people did during the pandemic we can learn from. And the danger is that people think, oh, now we just go back to normal and uh, pretend that, that the pandemic never happened and we didn't learn anything from it. Um, yeah, we do want to have more physical interaction again. I'm, I'm loving teaching my classes physically right now, but I really want to experiment more with Second Life, too. There are lessons learned from COVID and from that time that can give us new possibilities, um, but we don't want to see it as a way to pass judgment on the metaverse because we all had to learn very quickly with very little warning and very little support. So that's the first danger. A second danger, which we see happening right now, is the hype getting followed by anti-hype. So one reason all of this hype is dangerous is we've seen this in the last 20 years five, six times with Second Life. I can't even count, keep track anymore. Where there's hype about it, and then it's over. It's gone. Now it's going to be something else. Um, and a, a real danger right now is people saying it's all going to be chat GPT. The metaverse is over already. Um, and this anti-hype can be just as dangerous as the hype because it keeps us from learning and trying out new possibilities. And a real issue here, I think, has been the impact of meta and Mark Zuckerberg really pushing on this. First of all, Mark Zuckerberg totally gets VR and VW confused, right? It all started with buying Oculus Rift, all this obsession with Oculus and with the glasses, and making, you know, a really dumb metaverse that's, you know, for business meetings. You know, like, could you think of a more boring thing to do with the metaverse? Um, and don't even have legs, right, for your avatars? And so um, the impact of meta creating more confusion because they completely get VR and VW confused over and over again. And they're thinking about the metaverse in a very, very narrow way. And of course, because it's meta, they're obsessed with interoperability because they want to track you. So they want your Instagram and your Facebook and your Horizon Worlds VR to all be the same. They, they want interoperability and they pretend that it's somehow necessary, right? So that has been a real negative impact, actually, for the metaverse, I think. Zuckerberg created a lot of hype, but what he's really done is create a lot of anti-hype. And then part of this danger right now is also the emergence of chat GPT and generative AI, which has a lot of interesting possibilities, right? Even within Second Life, what these, uh, one person I know has called them autocorrect on steroids, um, what these things could could do that it could potentially be, you know, really wonderful. There could be some really, really good possibilities. Um, but that's not the same thing as the metaverse. And once again, the danger that people think, oh, 
the metaverse was 2022. Now it's uh, AI, chat GPT for 2023. It'll be something else next year. That is the idea of trying to make money by getting a product to market. It's not thinking carefully about what's really happening with human cultures online, right? And for me, as I move forward into some new research possibilities, and I look forward to taking this journey with many of you, there are a lot of possibilities that the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world just don't get, right? Um, that could be really great potential. We know that this room that we're in right now has a carbon footprint, that every one of our avatars has a carbon footprint. But we also know that it is way less than a physical body. Or if we had built this lovely, what is this, cavern or, or volcano thing in the physical world, right? And for us together right now talking from all over the world, if we had gotten on airplanes and used hotels, it would be a much bigger climate impact, obviously. So the metaverse has a lot of potential for combating climate change, even by reducing people's movement, but in ways so much more interesting and richer than what Meta is thinking of. The metaverse and the internet in general, but the metaverse in particular, has a lot of great potential for disability access and inclusion. If we really move towards what's called universal access and universal metaverse design, we can make it possible for disabled folks of various kinds to participate in society, including education, in so many new and empowering ways. And disabled folks have been incredible pioneers in this regard and are still at the forefront, frankly, of creative ways to be using the metaverse. I would much rather be learning from disability communities than Mark Zuckerberg. And even right now, there are simple things that we still can do um, to make the metaverse more accessible. I mean, even here in Second Life, why is it still the case in 2023 that when I build in Second Life, an object is called object? Um, and then people with visual impairment who use a, a text reader like Radagast, they can't tell what's a wall, what's a chair, what's a floor. If I make a document in Microsoft Word or Adobe Acrobat or PowerPoint or Keynote or anything, and I try to save it as document, it won't let me. It forces me to give it a name. So I give it a name. It's not a big deal. It takes me five seconds to do it. If Linden Lab would get the client here to require that, think about the difference it would make. Because right now, people have to go around and make an extra step to rename their objects. And if you look at your own inventory, or if you look around you know, buildings or homes in Second Life, you'll see lots of things that are named object, right? Just as a simple example. A third kind of frontier is you know, global south access, rural access, forms of interconnection. I have many friends and colleagues in Indonesia of course, having been there for so many years, um, you know, for anthropologists, like many professions, there are conferences that are very important for networking, getting to know people. Um, they are very excluded from that. And it's not just language. It's that it, those conferences almost always happen in the United States or Canada or Europe, and it's hard for them to get to. Um, but through the metaverse, you could totally change that dynamic and do really fun things that you couldn't even do in a physical world conference. And of course, there's great possibilities for the metaverse for education that once again can go way beyond what we saw during COVID and go back to work that people in this room have been doing for years. Um, sort of building off of the theme of this conference, um, Best practices are uncommon realities. This is a screenshot of some of you all here on the, the islands here. Um, like I said before, I think this group and the work of educators in Second Life and other virtual worlds is some of the most amazing creative work out there, pushing the frontiers of what the metaverse could be as a force for good. And 
we are sitting right now, right here together. This, not meta, <laughs> this is the future of the metaverse right here. And I look forward so much to our research journey, our activist journey, our educational journey that we will all be doing together. Thank you so much. That was great, Tom. Thank you so much. We have time for a couple of questions, so please put your questions in chat. Yes, if you put your questions in chat, I'll feed them to Tom. We have a couple of questions. Uh, let's see. Prof Dan asks, how do you see video conference in the scheme of the metaverse? Great question. That is an interesting um, question. I mean, I think, um, <clears throat> so if video conferences are, you know, showing your physical world body, um, like they're, they're not necessarily in the metaverse as such. I mean, there are ways they can do that, but I think there can be an important use for them. Once again, I think that, um, like you've probably heard of Zoom fatigue and people have talked about how it can actually be stressful to stare at 10 faces at once. Humans actually normally don't do that. It's not a normal way of interacting, like when you sit around at a table. And it can actually be nice to be like in a virtual world like we are right now where like, you know, my hair can be bad <laughs> and I, it doesn't matter because we're in a shared presence. But you could certainly imagine uh, you know, contexts where the video conferencing could be really important, um, depending on what you want to show or what you want to do. So, you know, I think that almost everything will have a role in the the metaverse. I don't think, um, once again, it's, it's the issue of not saying that it's necessary, but I think it could actually play a really interesting role. And, you know, one area where there's going to be really interesting stuff in the next few years will be ways in which virtual worlds and the physical world interact or overlay with each other. So like if you've heard of, you know, digital twins, that idea that like you take a neighborhood or a building or a city even uh, and you, you make it as close as you can identical in an online world and then you sort of have a, a twin of it. Um, I don't think everything in the metaverse should be or will be digital twins. Like, this is an amazing place, and it's really wonderful that it exists and doesn't have to be a twin of some place in the physical world. But you could imagine, you know, for architects, let's say, or for other groups, where having a digital twin could be really wonderful. So I, I'm sure it will play a, a role. And I'm afraid we've run out of time. So uh, thank you all very much. I'm going to turn it over to my friend iSky now, who will thank our wonderful keynote speaker.